Hello world, I'm Nick and welcome to another video about my favourite programming framework, .NET. In this video we're once again going to look at Blazor and I'm going to talk to you about Blazor's hosting models, namely Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. I'll give you an overview of the differences between these two hosting models, as well as an idea of how to pick between them for your next Blazor project. But first, if you're not already subscribed, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification button to keep up to date with all the latest .NET content on my channel. Now that's taken care of, let's get into the meat and potatoes, Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. by talking about what Blazor Server is specifically and how it works as a hosting model. So when we're talking about hosting models, we're talking about where the app runs from. So there are hosting models across all different kinds of apps. You'll have a server hosting an application, or you may have a desktop hosting an application, or you may have a mobile phone hosting an application natively on the device. So we're talking about where the app sits primarily, or the multiple locations in which it might sit that come together to form the application experience. In a Blazor server application, the app runs inside an ASP.NET Core application on the host server. Any data and elements that need to be delivered to the front end of the application are delivered to the client using SignalR. SignalR is a fantastic real-time communication framework that uses WebSockets. I've actually done a video on this where I built a chat application. And if you've not watched that already and want to hear more about SignalR, then take a look at that video. So here's an example of a Blazor server application. I've simply created a new Blazor server app using Visual Studio's template in .NET 7. Let's take a look at the host.cs HTML file. Here we can see a reference to the script framework slash blazor.server.js. This is the script that takes care of establishing the SignalR connection that I was talking about. That SignalR connection facilitates the real-time communication between front-end and the server back-end. Let's take a look at the project structure as well for a server app. You'll notice on the right-hand side in the Solution Explorer that we have a data folder. This is something that we won't have automatically in a WebAssembly project. More on that later. And in this folder, we'll find classes which help us you guessed it, fetch data from the backend, in this case, the server. We do this using services, which are registered for dependency injection at startup. We can then inject them into the page for front-end, back-end interaction. Let's take a look at this. So here we are in the program.cs class, and over here we've got builder.services.addSingleton of type weather forecast service. And weather forecast service is the default service that is added in a Blazor starter template. By registering it here as a singleton, meaning there'll be only one of them, we're making this available for dependency injection throughout the application. But how does this work on the page? How does it actually get the data from the server onto the front end? Well, over here in the pages folder, we have fetchdata.razor, and this is our front end for this page. And you can see at the top here, we have an inject directive. So we're saying we are injecting the weather forecast service as forecast service. And we're able to do that because we've registered it for dependency injection. That means then we can use some of the default events. So on initialized async, we can set a collection of weather forecast objects, in this case, an array to the result of a call into that service. So we can call forecast service dot get forecast async and that will return it into that collection in real time. Other aspects you can see in program.cs which are specific to Blazor server are things like the add server side Blazor method. This tells the project that it's using the server hosting model. Notice also that further down we've got app.mapBlazorHub. This is SignalR, which as I mentioned earlier is managing the connection between the front end and the ASP.NET Core backend. Another advantage to server-side Blazor using SignalR is its ability to recover from connection losses. So I've got the application running at the moment and I've contacted it on local host and I can see the page. I can go between pages and interact with the server as needed. So I can call fetch data and it will reach into that service, fetch the data for me. But if I was to then go into to Visual Studio and stop the application, you can see the application is attempting to reconnect. So it automatically has this feature built in that says, if I lose that connection to the server, I'll try to reobtain it. If I start the application again and then head back over to the server, it told me it couldn't reconnect, but I can reload the page and there you go. It's been able to reconnect its SignalR connection. So this is quite powerful in a production scenario because say there was heavy traffic on a server instance and things started to get a little bit shaky. As you're scaling up, 
your clients are not going to instantly just crash. They're going to try to reconnect. Another huge advantage that I really enjoy about Blazor server projects is the performance aspect. In server-side Blazor, I'm able to push or send data in real time thanks to that signal R connection, which means speed is very much the reality. If I move between pages, I'm getting a pretty much instant response to things. And when I first load the page, it loads instantly. There's pretty much no wait. It might be a different story depending on my internet connection once this was published, but in most cases, with most stable internet connections, it's gonna be pretty quick to load. So how about WebAssembly? How is that different to Blazor Server? Well, just like we did for Blazor Server, I'm bringing up here the equivalent WebAssembly project, also created in the same way using the Visual Studio template in .NET 7. The first obvious thing to me here is the project structure. So remember that data folder we had in the server project? Well, here in WebAssembly, that's gone. So where's the data coming from? We're still fetching weather forecast data. How is it different? Well, if I open up www root on the right-hand side, this is the directory where web apps commonly store static content. You'll see we have a sample data folder. Opening that up, you can see there's a file called weather.json. This is where the data is stored. But if we don't have a data folder, it's safe to say we don't have any services, right? Well, that would be a fair assumption. We don't have services in the same way by default fetching data for us like we do in Blazor Server. Looking at the program.cs file, we also don't have the same map blazor hub method, seeing as we're not using SignalR to support the hosting model. Now, we do have a builder object in the program.cs which sets up our application just like in Blazor Server, but instead of web application builder used in server projects, we instead have a WebAssembly host builder which is setting up WebAssembly as the hosting model for this project. So if we're not getting data via services, how do we fetch the data? Well, if I go over to the fetchdata.razor page for a WebAssembly project, you'll see that in WebAssembly, we actually perform a HTTP request, in this case, a GET request. So instead of using our registered weather forecast service like we did in the Blazor server project, we're actually performing a HTTP GET to the JSON that's stored statically in WW root. This means in this case, the data is all client side. In fact, that's the running theme with WebAssembly. Everything is client side, everything's pulled into the browser. And this is most notably seen when we first load the application. So I'm gonna start the WebAssembly application. And did you notice there we had a loading screen? Now that's not something we had in the server application, so why are we seeing that? Well, when we load a Blazor WebAssembly application, the app, the .NET runtime, any dependencies the project has, they're all downloaded to the browser, everything being executed within the same process. So that's what's happening when we have a loading screen. So as you can imagine, there's a bit of a performance penalty as a result of having the app and its runtime running in the same process. But what this does mean is that a Blazor WebAssembly app can run offline, which in some cases can be a huge advantage. So the big decision then, which one should you choose? Well, like most of these situations, the answer is the same. It depends. If performance is not a huge factor for you and you don't or can't connect to the internet in your use case, Blazor Wasm would be a great choice. I don't know if I'd said Wasm previously, but when I say Wasm, I mean WebAssembly. It's street talk. The other thing about these Blazor WebAssembly applications is that they can be served statically. And this is possible due to the lack of server-side code that's in use. And it means you can do really cool things with the way you deploy these applications, like storing them in an Azure storage account. And you know, that can often be a significant money saver compared to more traditional hosting models. Now, your application is just a set of files that's downloaded and compiled. However, if performance is super important for your use case or you need access to network resources, server resources, or you know there's wider implications about your architecture having to interact with lots of different uh, other hosts in the cloud, then yeah, Blazor Server is probably the best bet. And if you need some of more of that real-time communication, more real-time updates from a distant server, then again, Blazor Server is the way to go. But whatever you choose for your next project, I really hope you found it useful and that you're able to pick a hosting model that works for you. There's also another hosting model, Blazor Hybrid, which I'm not gonna cover in this video, but I may cover in a video upcoming. It's changing all the time. So who knows, by the time I do the next one, Microsoft may have changed it. But until we meet again, thank you so much for watching the video. Please don't forget to subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And I will see you again soon for some more great .NET content.